Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joining us from all around the world for today's With Insight event. My name is Nikki Parker, and I lead marketing and communications for Insight Partners. For those of you who haven't joined our With Insight event, this is Insight's thought leadership series, where we bring on thought leaders to discuss some of today's tougher topics, things that are relevant in conversation today. And we will be talking about the future of education and the role that technology is going to play in it. I'm really excited to bring on our thought leader for today, Shai Rashef. Shai is a businessman and an, an academic administrator who, after a career in for-profit education, founded the University of the People in, 20, in 2009, a non-profit accredited online academic institution that seeks to increase the availability of higher education by offering tuition-free degrees. Shai's 2014 TED Talk best sums up his belief that higher education is a basic human right and that knowledge must be democratized. Shai will be in conversation with Insight Partners Managing Director, Devin Parekh, a passionate supporter of access to education and of the University of the People. A little bit of housekeeping, we will be using the Q&A feature today. So please make sure that you pop your questions in and Devon and Shai will get to them throughout the course of the conversation. So thank you very much. Enjoy today's With Insight. Welcome Shai and Devon. Well, thanks Nikki for the introduction and thank you Devon and for inviting me and for all the support. Um, I, a few words about, about myself. I was uh, in for-profit education for over uh, 20 years. Among other things, I started the first online university in Europe, which was a partnership uh, with the University of Liverpool. We basically deliver their online, online degrees. And it was the first online university in Europe. It was, for me, it was a great revelation. For the first time, I realized the power of online. We had students from all over the world, they can stay at home, keep their job, but at the same time, get this great European education. At the same time, I also realized that for most people, it was nothing but a wishful thinking. It was too expensive. Went to New York on a semi-retirement, just to realize that retirement is not really for me. I'm too hyper, I have to continue. But I didn't want to do more of the same. I felt I'm fortunate, I have enough. It's my turn to give back. And for me to give back must have been in education because as we all know, as at least that I'm sure that everyone knows, if you educate one person, you can change a life. But if you educate many, you can change the world. So I looked around and I realized that everything that made this European university so expensive is available for free. Open source technology, open educational resources, content that people put on the net for the rest of the world to use for free, and the new internet culture where people were willing to teach and learn from each other for free. So I said, wait a second, all I have to do is to put it together and create a tuition-free university. So I did. And that's the story of the University of the People. <laughs> Great. Well, we're going to come back to the University of the People uh, in a few minutes. But I thought maybe we can just start out by kind of framing uh, the opportunity, uh, which is what I see is just this uh, massive gap uh, between the people who would like to get an education and have, have access to the, uh, that education. Can, do you have some thoughts in just in terms of framing what the size of that problem is? So UNESCO stated that in 2025, actually in three, four years from now, there will be 100 million people who will seek seats in, in universities that will not exist. So 100 million people who will try to uh, get into higher education but can't. And the best example, by the way, is Nigeria. Every year, a million and a half students pass the university entrance exams, but there are seats available. There are seats available for half a million, which means that by definition, a million students a year are deprived from higher education, simply a lost generation. And this is only one reason. There are those who cannot attend for um, financial reasons. We see the situation in the US. There are those who cannot attend for cultural reasons, women in many countries, as an example, political reasons, uh, refugees, and undocumented. And so there are unbelievable number of people who cannot attend higher education. By the way, to give one, of, uh, one more US number, uh, 32 million people in the US have some academic education, but have never completed their, their higher education. And when so, you say academic, you, you mean higher ed, you mean college? Yes. 
Yeah. They attended college for at least some times, but never graduated. Yeah. And, and do we have, do you have a sense of why that is? What are the reasons? What are the, the top few reasons that people don't finish? Financial would be a huge one. A lot of people start and they realize that they cannot uh, afford it and they, they are not willing to stay in debt for the rest of their lives. Uh, flexibility, you know, people get married, people need to work, but they can't combine, even if they have the money, they can't combine work and their studies. And there are a lot of personal reasons. People who are young and, you know, they're not serious then and they start and say, ah, I don't want to, to continue the drop and then they can never come back. So there are a lot, that, that's a lot of reasons. Now, obviously there are those who can never afford to start with, but those who start and drop, these are the main reasons, yeah. Shai, is one of the other, there's been a lot written about obviously the cost, I'll use the US right now, but the cost of, of, of higher education has gone up dramatically. And there's <clears throat> arguments that get made that the return on investment for a college education maybe isn't high enough. Uh, that if, if you're paying 30 or $40,000 a year to attend a private school, um, that's not maybe uh, perceived as a top 50 or top 100 school, that you don't really get enough of a return on that investment. Do you have a view on whether there, there's actually a return today on, uh, on higher education at, at today's cost? Well, let's start that with the University of the People when we are tuition free, you have a great well, no, no, we're not, we're not, no, we're, we're not talking about <laughs> infinite ROI yet. We're right now, we're, the denominator is not zero right now. But, but, but I think that in general, education pays off. Most people who get into higher education and get a degree, um, eventually, and actually the, the studies that are out there shows that traditionally, yes, it pays off, but it's not true for everyone. I mean, you know, if you don't go to one of the uh, good universities and you pay, as you said, 30 or 40,000 a year and you end up with 100,000, it might not be worth it. Uh, and that's why a lot of people these days feel, you know, the number of people who go to higher education decreasing all over the world for that very reason. Because people think, you know, I can, I can uh, be, take vocational studies and forgive me for saying that, but if you study some programming and, and get a great job, you don't need higher education. Whether it will pay off in the long run, whether that's the right decision for your entire future, that's a different question, but for the short term, for sure. Yeah. So actually there's, a, there, there's two interesting things uh, you raised there by talking about the vocational education, which I don't think is something that we should throw away as, as, as not a viable uh, alternative for people. Um, in fact, our, uh, we got some data from our friends at BCG educational practice. Um, and one of the things they talked about is that many employers believe, particularly in something like coding, um, that I think it was 65% of employers said that having certification uh, around a skill will probably be sufficient um, to actually get employed and, and, and you might not actually need a degree. Again, depending on what it is and what the skill certification is, do you have kind of a view of how do you think, how, how do you think, higher, how important, we're gonna talk about university people and accreditation later, but how important is that piece of paper, you think? You know, I, I, I disagree with these uh, employers because yes, for, you know, if you take someone who studied computer science and have all the knowledge, all the theories, but don't know how to, you know, don't, is not as, as familiar with a certain uh, software as someone who took course like bootcamp and he's a specialist in that. So for many employers, that's all they need. And if they take someone from a university, he's actually less capable to start with than someone who came out of bootcamp. I think that it's a big mistake for the long run because the question is what, what is going to happen in five years when this specific software is going to be obsolete? Is, the, is this employee has enough capabilities to learn new software? Is he open-minded? Does he have critical thinking? Does, is he able to work in teams? So I think that education and, and academic education, good academic education gives you much more than the vocational studies. Now, when, when I believe that it should be the combination, yes, study computer science, but also get some general general knowledge because in the long run, I think that it will pay off. I think that many employers look at the short term and in the short term, they want someone who knows what they need right now and they don't look what will happen in 10 years. So, yeah. So the other thing you talked about, um, the other thing you talked about is, um, you use Nigeria as the example, but I think that example extends to other parts of the world where you have this demand, but not supply. 
Why is that? Most markets where you have a supply and demand imbalance, it gets solved over time. Um, why is that a supply demand imbalance in so many countries been more permanent in education? Well, start by looking at universities in general. Why does any one of the best universities don't take 10 times more students than they can? In every industry, if you can have 10, 10 times more clients, you will be thrilled. Universities is the opposite because they feel that that's how they preserve the brand name. That's how they build their prestige. Now, first of all, that's worldwide. Saying the other part of it is that, that higher education is extremely expensive. Building a university is expensive. You know, the real estate, training enough professors. And, you know, when you go to developing countries, they don't have the resources to do that. Now, the only way to do it, you know, and, and when you look traditionally, they couldn't meet the demand. And, you know, take Ghana. Now we're looking to at another country that they said, okay, let's make a couple of years ago, Let's make high school uh, free. So secondary education is free in Ghana. Great. Now they have million <laughs> graduates every year, but they don't have higher education for them. Free or not free, they don't have. And, and it's a huge investment, which most countries cannot, cannot meet. By the way, in most countries in the world, and, and the UK is the best example, every year they cut the budget of higher education. They don't increase it. So the demand is increasing. The supply is not. And... We'll talk later about how online can fit there, but that's the main uh, challenge here. Yeah. So Nikki, Nikki pays me a dollar every time I say the word scale up. So I'm going to collect one dollar at least right now, which is that um, I, if you think about what you're really what, what you're saying, I think, um, and that I think is a good lead in to COVID and then the university of the people, is that educational institutions are not fundamentally easy scale ups. It's not easy to if you're Harvard to double or triple or quadruple, I'm using Harvard, but I could use any college, uh, double or triple or quadruple your employment, uh, your uh, enrollment quickly. I mean, is that kind of the fundamental point? Yeah, if they don't, using the traditional uh, system and the traditional way of teaching, it's very hard to scale up. You have a class for 50, for 50 people, you need to build another building or start teaching at night, but there are limits to how, and you have certain number of professors. And even, even before getting into the unions and how much they are going to teach, et cetera, there are limits to how much you can grow unless, if, unless you change the system. Yes, you're right. So let's talk about COVID um, and the impact the COVID has had. And at least as it relates to what we're talking about today, I think, at least to me, it appears like there's some positive impacts and there's been some negative impacts. Um, let's start with potentially the positive, which is Many, many schools uh, are using remote learning. And obviously there's been a lot of debate about how effective it is. And it's probably a different answer for a first grader or a second grader than, or a kindergartner than it is for a college student. Um, but uh, what's your sense of what COVID has shown as it relates to the efficacy of remote learning? Well, I think it goes both directions. On the one hand, everyone realized that you can, you can move to online. And online works. Do you like it? That's a different question. And my argument will be that most, and I'm talking about higher education, that's what I know better, uh, most universities simply shut down their campuses and moved online without any preparation, without, without know, knowing the right pedagogy, without training their people and, and, and their students. So for many, it was a disaster because you can't you, you can't shut your campus, move, move to Zoom and say, okay, the Zoom replace a face-to-face replace a -face -face lecture. It does not. There are things that make it, make it work and very few institutions were willing to do it, especially because they, everyone believes that it's temporary, right? So for one semester, am I going into building a new pedagogy and a new infrastructure? Let's do whatever we can do and, and it will be okay. And for a lot of professors, not only students, so definitely students and professors, it was a bad experience. Saying that it um, legitimized online I don't think that there will be a certain, a certain, a single university that will not teach in the future, at least some courses online. 
uh, the flexibility for the students, you know, eight o'clock in the morning course. Why do I have to wake up as a student? <laughs> my son, my son is lying in bed, uh, you know, on class right now. So, <laughs> and you can, you know, and 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 even more. I mean, when you think about it, you have a professor that speak very, very slowly. You can fast forward them. You don't understand something. You don't need to raise your hand and stop the entire class. You can just go back and listen again. So there are major advantages to online that people learn to admire. I think, you know, I'm looking at us uh, when we were, you know, years ago, we were on the margin, like online is not the real thing. Now we are the mainstream. We are the real thing that everyone tries to imitate. So good and bad. Yeah. Well, with, uh, the other negative, I think what is laid bare is kind of the economic model of, 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 of universities, right? Um, so if you think about the um, so, for example, I have a son in college, and we're certainly paying his tuition, even though he's studying remote, but we're not paying his room and board because he's not there. So it, it seems like there's many, many schools. You have a small set of schools have massive endowments who are probably are going to be able to live through that storm. But what do you think the impact of COVID is going to have on the large number of universities who basically don't actually have endowments and are, are, and are dependent on annual operating revenue to run their school. I'm, I'm sure that hundreds and hundreds of universities will close that will be will be closed. They'll have to close their, their doors because first of all, um, a lot of students, as you said, saying, why, you know, you taught me online, why should I pay the same amount of money? Second, uh, when they even when they go back, a lot of people because of the recession cannot afford sending their kids to college with this amount of money. So they will lose students. And if they lose 5% of their students for this reason, well, how many, how many universities can afford operating with 5% less? Then, very few. then you go into budget, into state's budget. A lot of states cut the budget because of the recession. They have other priorities and other hit. Then something that we don't always think are foreign students. While foreign students, international students, usually a small percentage of, uh, the of the cohort of students, they are the only one who paid the entire amount without any discount. So, you know, it's a huge um, effect on, uh, on universities if you lose these students and they are, um, you know, right now, hardly any international students is coming and it's not clear what, what is going to happen later on when the COVID will be behind us. So I think that, uh, a lot of um, a lot of universities will have to change, and change means the only way I can see it is how do you change your financial model and cast cut your cost and um, give it to the students. Well, a lot of universities will have hard time cutting their costs. You know, simply because you know you have a cost structure, you have union, you have buildings that you have to do. What do you do? And in many cases, they will not have any choice but literally closing down. I think, I think what we've established is that, you know, we've proven that there is some model for online that can work. We've also said that there's a supply demand imbalance. And we've also said that uh, the economic model for terrestrial universities is probably gonna be challenged, which might lead to even less supply. Um, so that's the right transition point to university of the people. Um, so how do you, how do you address all those, all three of those issues, but maybe let's step back for a second. Why don't you be a little bit more specific about University of the People, what the model is, how many students you have today. Uh, let's start there and then we'll go from there. Okay, so University of the People is a nonprofit, tuition-free, accredited American online university that opened its gates to any students who graduate high school, qualified for higher education, but doesn't have the opportunity for that. Uh, we only offer business administration, computer science, and health science associate and bachelor degree, as well as MBA and master in education. The degrees that are most likely will help our students find a job because the students who come to us are survivors of the genocide in Rwanda, the earthquake in Haiti, a lot of homeless in the US and, and refugees from all over the world. Because this is the kind of students that we have, we, we teach them in small classes of 20 to 30. How, how many students total, uh, Shai? How, how many total enrolls 
Enrolled. We started in 2009. We had we had 500 students in 2014. Since then, we double every year. Right now, we have 57,000 students coming from 200 countries and territories, and we are on route to have 100,000 students this coming September. So we are doubling ourselves, and we see ourselves continuing to double. But even though we have 57,000 students, every student, when they take a class, it's with 20 to 30 students from 20 to 30 different countries. And um, we, we, as, and we, are, um, we are tuition free, but we are not free. We expect the students while they take the courses for free and no textbooks involved. Uh, by the end of each course, we expect them to pay $120 for assessment fees which means a full BA is 4,800 over as long as it takes them. If they don't have the money, we give them scholarships. It's our mission that nobody would be left behind for financial, for financial reasons. Uh, talking about uh, our financial model, uh, with this 120 uh, US dollars per end of each end of course, we are financially sustainable. Uh, that means that all the operation is being covered by the 120 US dollars. Donations that we, give, that we get are going mainly for scholarships for those who cannot afford even this 120. Uh, just to give you a sense, uh, we have 57,000 students, NYU, which we partner with, have 51,000 students, so they are smaller. But even so, both of us as Similar budget in a sense that both of us have 13 in our budget, except that they have 13 billion on their budget. We have 13 million on our budget with more students. It's unfair comparison. We are not a research university. We, we use volunteers and etc. But we are we are operating on a shoestring. But the thing is that I think, and this is extremely important, we are showing that higher education not only can be accessible to all and affordable, it can be financially sustainable, which I believe is extremely important when we build this model, showing the world what we think should be the future of higher education. Well, I'm a proud, as you know, supporter uh, of, of your scholarship program. Um, but, but let's just talk about this. It's a staggering statistic comparing NYU to University of the People, right? And, and then if you think about it, you, you, you multiply that by the number of universities that exist in the US. Somebody had a question on why do we continue to invest tax revenue in models that are inefficient and unable to scale? Um, so as, you, as we think about the NYU model, uh, and I'm not picking on NYU, but, um, but as we kind of think about the traditional model, what, what are the fundamental differences? Maybe you can talk a little bit more about, for example, how, do how do you actually admit students? How do you actually pay teachers? So what are your actual expenses? Because I think we need to, um, I'm, I'm going to get a second dollar from Nikki because you're clearly a scale up because you're doubling every year. Um, but I, I think what we need to really learn more is how do we not only make sure that you continue to um, are successful, but what are the lessons that we can take from what the University of People is doing, because we're not going to enroll every student at the University of People. So, what are the lessons we can learn from how University of People is doing it? So, for everybody else. So let let me start by a short story that once a few years ago I had, I was interviewed by a Brown University kind of students newspaper, and she heard about our model and she said, "Wait a second, are you setting up a competition to Brown?" And my answer was, you know, I have to be honest with you and tell you that if ever someone will come to me and say, I'm not sure if I should go to Brown or the University of the People, I don't know if at that point I will laugh or cry because it means that clearly I failed. I'm not an alternative to Brown. I'm an alternative to those who have no other alternative. Those who can go to Brown or NYU or Harvard should go there. We don't give what they give. So, um, you, you know, we give great education and our graduate work in great companies, but we give education, but nothing else. We don't give, we don't give any extracurricular activity, activities. 
Uh, the courses that we teach are very limited. Not only that we don't offer many degrees, when you touch it with studying with us computer science, we pretty much tell you what courses you have to take. And even the elective are not, are not a, a lot. So you don't get as much as the richness of our experience is not, is not the same. And you know, let's be honest, the networking that you create going to that universities, you don't get with us. You get different networking. You meet people from all over the world, amazing people, but different kind, different kind of people. The admission, the admission in our university, you asked about it, is pretty much open. On the one hand, we said anyone with high school diploma and proficiency in English are welcome to come. Come and take two of our courses. Um, one course is online strategies, which where we teach you about our pedagogy, what is plagiarism, how to study online, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The second one is from your field of choice. So if you study business administration, take one course of business administration or computer science, etc. You take these two courses and you have to pass them in order to continue with us. Now, a lot of people don't. Either because, you know, oh, it's tuition free, I sign up I'll, and, and I'll get a degree by email. It doesn't work this well. Either because we tell them every course that you take with us, every single course, you have to spend 15 to 20 hours a week. And the human nature is that's true for others. I can make it in an hour a week. Well, one hour, hour goes by and you are out because you can't make it in an hour. Maybe you don't like our pedagogy. It's peer-to-peer -peer learning. But if you like all that and you show us that you meet our standards and you pass the courses, you are welcome. If you don't meet our academic standards, you can't continue with us. You can take the course again, but you can't. We don't consider you a degree-seeking student, and you cannot continue with us. So, what percentage of people? What percentage of people shy kind of get through those? Talk about the funnel. Like in a year, you can use last year as an example. How many people start? How many people end up passing? How many people enroll? So I, I would say that over fifty percent of the students fail. That to, well. Don't pass the two failed is not many of them, as I said, after one week, they're not with us. Uh, do not pass them. After they become degree seeking students, as I said, we count yeah. them, 85% of them continue to second year, which is, by the way, much better than community, the average in community colleges, definitely many uh, online universities. But that's, that's a mechanism that we created. And when you think about our philosophy, it's such an efficient, an efficient way because we don't, you know, take a typical university, they have like 100, 200, 300 people in their department, academic de admission department. We have four people. All you need to check is that their high school diploma is indeed the real accredited high school uh, diploma and you let them in. So you save a lot of money. You let them try to give them the opportunity and therefore you can open it to everyone who deserve higher education but you actually create a funnel that only the talented and the qualified one can continue. By the way, I think it's a great admission uh, system that many universities should do. Why not? But um, so that's so let's talk about the, the teaching. So how do you because one of the comments that one of the questions or comments somebody had while we're talking is they can't imagine that you could actually have 60,000 students. How is this possible with 13 million dollars? Like so the expenses okay. obviously so let's talk a little bit more in detail about what the structure actually looks like okay I'll, one word before the teaching because the entire yeah. first of all we don't have building remember that yeah. second we operate from every part of the world where we can achieve quality at efficient price so the academics are all in the u.s the administration is in the middle east all of our it is being developed in the west bank palestine and we, our students, the different student administration and services are being handled mostly in India and in Africa. So we achieve the quality in a fraction, in a fraction of the price. The instructors also coming to us as volunteers. By the way, we have 23,000 volunteers. However, we don't need that many, about 1,000 of them are teaching. They come to us as volunteers. And when they teach with us, we pay them on a and the honorarium is basically a gratitude for their work. But saying that, you know, in the long run, I can't, um, I, I, I'm not saying that we are not going to pay more, but right now they are, get, they are getting honorarium. That's what enables us to get to a big number. We don't, we have so many people who want to volunteer with us. And when you think about it, our teachers, first of all, they need to spend 10 to 15 hours a week, which is a lot. 
but the reward that they get, that they meet students that they will never meet otherwise. Think about, and some of them are retired professors and they wake up in the morning, take their cup of, that's water, but maybe their cup of coffee. <laughs> and they sit in with their cup of coffee, open their laptop and here they have 20 amazing students, refugees from Syria, from Myanmar, people who sell fruits on the streets in Africa, homeless in, um, in the US. You never meet these students. So great experience for the teachers. Others are professors that have tenure somewhere and want to give back. And a lot, a lot of them are young PhDs who want university of the people <laughs> stamp on their CV. So they come and teach with us. They hardly, uh, hardly drop. They stay with us for a long time. Actually, the main challenge that we have is that if they're not, uh, they are not performing good enough, we fire them. And every term I'm getting a few emails of professors saying, we don't understand the rules of the game. We are volunteering with you. How can you fire us? <laughs> and the answer is, if you're not good enough, you're so, not with us. So, so listen, but, we're yeah. here, we, you know, we've all been on Zoom for the last year, and we all know how half the time we, we have a bad Wi-Fi connection sitting here in even New York or Miami or wherever it is. How do you deal with remote learning for somebody who's in Syria or somebody who's in Myanmar or somebody who's in Africa where their broadband connection might not be good, they're, they're, um, they might not have a great laptop? Like, How do you actually, from a technology standpoint, deal with the digital divide? So first of all, if you don't have any internet connection, obviously you cannot study yeah, with us. However, we build a system so you can study with us with any with, with any device and any internet connection. So whether it is computer, laptop, iPad, cell phone, you can study with us. We have students who study with a, a dial-up, through dial-up, and we have students who study in internet cafe. And it works because we don't, we don't use, bandwidth is not mandatory for us. So we build the system because this is our population to start with its text base. So all the communication is text-based, all the material is text-based. Recently, in the last couple of years, we realized that by having text only, we so-called punish the students who have broadband and they can enjoy the richness of the internet. So what we do, we send them to, we send them to watch videos, but the videos are transcribed. And we tell them, if you have video, go watch this Yale video, this MIT video, Khan Academy video, if you don't have broadband, here is the text. And this way they can study uh, anywhere. Uh, moreover, because everything, nothing is, is synchronous. So everything is being done in, um, in chunks of weeks. And every week, you know, I, I'll say in a sentence how, how it works. So when students sign up for a course, uh, he meet the 20, 30 students like himself, see their bio and go to the first week. And let's say, and it, every week, it's eight weeks every course. Every week starts on Thursday, ends on Wednesday. Thursday morning, the first students, let's say they teach Chinese simply because the morning starts first in China. He goes into the class, he sees the lecture notes, the reading assignment, the homework assignment, and the discussion question. And the discussion question is the core of our studies. So the first student read everything, saw the discussion question, and decided to come to put his own original contribution to the class discussion. Let's say that the second student is Indian and she does the same, but at, this, at that point she sees what the, the, what the Chinese uh, wrote and she decide, decides to comment on what the Chinese said. And let's say that the third student is Syrian and he does the same. The Chinese is very likely to go back to the class to see what other people said about his point and discussion develop between them. Our pedagogy is peer-to-peer -peer learning, discussion between the students all week long under the supervision of the instructor who is there every day, read everything that the students, that the students write and decide to intervene only if needs to. Someone writes a mistake, some, some, someone asks a question and nobody was able to answer. Some, someone writes something wrong. He needs to correct, or maybe the discussion went to the road to the wrong direction to the wrong direction and needs to be redirected. Um, all week long, they discuss among themselves. Every week, they must have at least every student's one original contribution to the class discussion, at least three times to comment on what other people say. By the end of the week, they had a quiz to see that they master the material. They hand in their homework, which assessed 
randomly and anonymously by three of their peers under the supervision of the instructor. Uh, they get grades for their homework assignment, for their quiz, for their um, uh, contribution to the class discussion, and they go to the next week. Eight weeks in a row, um, eight, week, eight weeks in a row, ninth week is a final exam, which is proctored by live proctor. They get a grade for the course and move on. Do, do they get a grade, like an ABC type grade, or is it just pass fail? So they no, get a grade. They get a real grade. They can appeal the grade. It's a, it's a regular, yes. it's a regular university. By the way, what is important, it's asynchronous. They can come anytime they want from any internet connection. And you know, it's anytime, anywhere uh, from any internet uh, connection they have. So now look, you obviously have different, you know, Jesus, students from 200 um, different countries, but also people who are in very different situations, right? Anything from a homeless person to a refugee to maybe somebody in the US who's working doesn't have a college degree and kind of wants to get them. Maybe they've already taken some credits. So when students come to you, um, are there any different experiences? Meaning if say somebody already has a year of credit uh, before they come, or is everybody's process exactly the same? They take those two classes and, or are people able to actually bring credits with them? Everyone takes the same classes. However, the same two courses in order to be admitted, but then after that, uh, they can transfer credit. We let them, and we have a lot of students who drop out of other colleges because of the of the price, and they come to us. They transfer to us. Uh, they can transfer up to half of the of the degree, half of the courses, and in certain uh, circumstances, even three quarter of the degrees. But you know, as you said, we have you know. I'll I'll, I'll tell you a story of one of our students, um, just to give an example of yeah. the kind of students that we have. About a year ago, we decided to have videos of our students and uh, someone sent me a story of our students. His name is Roger from Kenya. And when he was 10 years old, his parents split. His mother was kicked out of the house with the three kids. He was the older of them. She went to the woods and built a hut there for herself and for the three kids and went to coffee plantation in Kenya uh, and start working there for half a dollar a day. 50 cents a day, and they somehow managed to live on this amount. They stayed in the hut all day long. She worked. After a few months, she came shivering. Um, she had high fever. He took her on her shoulders to the nearby hospital, five miles nearby, uh, nursed her for two weeks, and then she passed away from pneumonia. And here he is, 10 years old. He's the, he's the adult of the kids, right? He's the oldest. So he went to look for his father, just to realize that his father passed away as well. So he decided he had no choice and he went to work in this, the same coffee plantation. A few months later, a friend of his mother came because she did just to realize that she passed away. She saw the kids and started sending them money. After a few more months, she came with uniform and told Roger, I want you to study. I'll pay for your studies. You go and start studying. So he went all the way until high school graduate high school, his dream was to continue his education, but he couldn't, no way for him to afford higher education until he found University of the People, he got full scholarship and he was en route to, um, you know, to, to become, a, to have a better career. Put a pause on this story for a second because a few months I got a, through the pandemic, every every beginning of term, I send emails to the students, and now they have my email address, and I get hundreds of emails from the students. And I got an email from a student saying, listen, I was kicked out of the university uh, because I failed the last term. And I just want to promise you, President Reshev, that you are my only hope. And even though you told me that I'm uh, being kicked out and I can come back only in after three years, I will come back because I have to continue. You are my only hope for a better future. I will study there. Now, I was I sent the email to my uh, chief of staff telling her, because I get a lot of emails like this. It's not that unique. What was unique was that he was said that he was kicked out for three years and the policy is one year. I said, why did we kick him for three years? What's the story? And five minutes later, I get uh, I get a um, back a, a email from, from Caroline saying, read the entire email, and this is the same Roger from last year, and I read the entire email, 
And he said that the reason that he failed is that he lost his daughter for pneumonia. And sorry, for the COVID, his mother was pneumonia because of the COVID and he had to take care of her and he couldn't study and he failed. Now, he's going to be back with us in a couple of months, but that's the kind of students and can he succeed? You know, I'm not sure. Because when you're coming with such a background, and obviously his academic background is not very strong. We'll try to help him. And by the way, comparing us to other universities, we can, cannot give support to these students as much as other universities can. But on the other hand, to the other side of the, of the, of the spectrum, a couple of months ago, I wake up and I see Google alert with the University of the People and you know, someone wrote about us. So I opened, the, I, I opened the, this email and they see, that um, the first uh, rocket scientist of Ethiopia is one of our graduates. <laughs> there was an article about her and he bragged of having MBA from the University of the People. So we have those and we have those. And we are, you know, as diverse as, as, as you can get, so. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk a second about the diversity. Why don't you talk about the demographic makeup of your 60,000, 57,000 students? So, I'll tell you about our, we, it's easier to count for our American students. So I'll tell about American yeah. students, even though yeah. it's pretty much uh, the same. 30% um, of our students are black compared to 14% nationally. So we have more than twice black yeah. uh, than others. 60% of our students are first generation, stu first generation student, the first in their families to go to higher education compared to 33 a national average, and 50% of our students are parents, while the national average is 22. What I found most fascinating is that 30% of our faculty, which we didn't know because, you know, we never meet them, right? So 30% of our faculty are black compared to 6% nationally. So wow. this is, this is a definitely different demographic, a, I don't think that any university in the U.S. has, a, or in the world, for this, uh, um, have th that kind of uh, of diversity. So, yeah. so you, you, you talked about those couple of examples of students, but if you kind of go at a higher level, what's been the track record of the students who graduated in terms of being able to get jobs, and kind of what types of companies are they able to get jobs at, and how does it compare, you think, to your, you know, your your competition? So. <laughs> <laughs> to our company, well, <laughs> uh, we do we doing we doing uh, extre extremely extremely well. When you look at our at our graduate, eighty two percent of our graduates are employed. Uh, we have to say we have to say that um, we have to say that we are a young university. We give our students ten because of the kind of students that we have, and because. Uh, 90% of them work while studying with us, we give them 10 years to complete a BA. So we don't have tons of, of graduates. Well, we have over 2000 graduates and we double every year. But remember that five years ago, we had 500 students. So the numbers are not huge, but 82% um, of them are employed. Uh, we have graduate work in Google, Amazon, uh, IBM, Microsoft, uh, amazing comp World Bank, JP Morgan, amazing, amazing places. Um, you know, the, the great example for me is that when we uh, develop our new program of program advising, so we started hiring people to be a single point of contact for our students because we realized that our students are being, many of them are being lost. You know, you get an email from the provost. Even if you are an American, you might not know what provost is. If you are not a man, what the hell is a provost? I'm on probation, what does it mean, why, et cetera. So they have a person from the day they, they are being accepted until they graduate, they have one single person that is their point of contact, help them with everything they, are, they have, encourage them to stay, help them when they have difficulties. So when we decided to open this department, which is by the way, is a, one of the main reason for us having a, a higher retention than others, we said, let's do it with our graduates. So we went to our graduates in Africa and we said, come work with us. Well, hardly anyone need us. They have other jobs, which, you know, we are very happy that they have other jobs, but they have great jobs. They don't need us. 15% of our graduates continue toward their graduate studies. But I'll say two more, two more things. First of all, talking about our quality, 
Uh, we are partners with NYU, uh, Columbia, Edinburgh, uh, um, IFAT University uh, of Saudi Arabia, uh, LAU, and we just announced a uh, two weeks ago partnership and uh, collaboration with Harvard Business School uh, online. Uh, all with Harvard Business School online, our students can go there, take, select three courses, come back to us with these courses. We give them credit for them. Harvard give them price for these three courses, which is similar, pretty similar uh, to our prices, which I'm sure you all appreciate Harvard uh, charging 150 per course. Yeah. And then they get also a certificate for the job market. So coming out with our degree and certificate is great. But you know, our agreement with Berkeley is that our students after two years with us can transfer to Berkeley, complete their degree. And the first students who did it uh, just completed her uh, studies with uh, Berkeley. She studied two years with us, great students, moved to Berkeley, completed the degree with straight A and was just accepted to uh, MIT for her graduate studies. You know, a typical student, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not a typical one, but we have, we have great students and all these universities and, and, and they have great jobs. Now, I started by, you know, we are still young. So let's see how we will be in five and 10 years. But so far we are extremely happy with how our graduates do. So, so what are your, what is, what are your biggest challenges uh, uh, I know you can always say fundraising, so I'm going to put that one aside, but putting fundraising aside, what are your biggest challenges as you think about kind of scaling and going from 50,000 to 100,000 to 500,000 students? Because you could be the solution for this supply demand gap, right? In Nigeria, there's nothing that's stopping those million students who don't have a seat to potentially be using you other than the platform and having enough teachers. And so what are your biggest uh, challenges as you kind of grow over the next five to 10 years? So first and foremost, knowing about us, you know, all the people that are on the call, how many of them heard about us before they got the invitation? Probably the overwhelming majority haven't. Uh, most people in the world haven't heard about us. And, you know, TED Talk and us daily did a piece about us, which over 30 million people watch still. The overwhelming majority of the people in the world, especially, you know, if you're a refugee, and we have scholarships for every refugees. By the way, we haven't talked about it. We have 6,000 refugees. We took more refugees than any university in the world. But how would a typical refugee hear about us? So spreading the word is the number one challenge that we have. Second challenge is that when they come to us, um, Yes, as you mentioned, we're not talking about it now, but it's scholarship, making sure that those who need scholarship, but let me stop for a second and thank you for, for the scholarship that you give for our students. That's extremely important. We couldn't afford it without people like you, Devin, who help us um, and the matching uh, of the a company to, to enable our, our student, our, to, give, to give scholarship to our students. So that's the second. The third is managing the growth. I mean, all the people on the call are businessmen and they know that managing the growth is the hardest thing. How do you know what will not work in a few months? Do you have enough instructors? Are the training work? Is the system work? You know, so managing the growth is something- So, so, so just so I can get the third dollar, scale up challenges. Scale up challenges, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I repeated it as well, so you can- I get $4. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, <laughs> 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 Nikki just wrote it's fine <laughs> but but last and not least and we talked about you know about corporates listen now they have jobs uh, most corporates haven't heard about us as well first second will they be willing to take our diversity on the one hand every company uh, want these days the diversity and our students offer amazing diversity you know i talked about our yeah. students but are they open for that and my challenge is, is to make sure that they find decent jobs for them because our students you know they learn when you when you take when you study in colombia that's that's what our provost is, is from colombia always says when you come to Colombia, they don't need to worry. You will find a job just because you studied in Colombia. That's not the case with your people. So we need actively to help them find a job. And we see it as one of our responsibilities. So, so we obviously have a lot of people on the phone who could, could hire uh, your graduates. 
how, how do they how do they do that how do you access your students is there do you actually have what are some of the services you offer them as it relates to career placement and other you know kind of support and how do how does how does insight in our portfolio companies um, access your students so first of all we have a career service center uh, which is first prepare our students kind of we teach them how to prepare for a job, in, how to search for a job, how to prepare for a search interview, how to open LinkedIn page, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are now soon, we are going to our, uh, actually in the process of uh, hiring a director of corporate relationship that will be the person to go, uh, to go to companies and build a relationship because relationship can be from uh, hiring our graduates. Big companies can use us to actually educate their employees, uh, give scholarship to their employees or to our students. There are so many ways that we can collaborate. Uh, feel free to go to our website. And if you want, send, drop me an email. I'll direct you right away. And it's very easy. We'll, we'll, we'll share your, <laughs> we're going to share your contact information with everybody. Very easy. Uh, and uh, uh, um, no, no problem at all. And, and we, are, we are quite efficient. We're still young enough and, and small enough to give... Uh, so to do the right things. <laughs> here's where I, I'm going to end on this note. If 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 President Biden called you up tomorrow and said, "Shy, I want you to be Secretary of Education, um, and I want you to think about not the University of the People, but I want to think about the lessons you learned about from Education of the People, and help apply them to a national education policy," what would you focus your energy on? I'm not sure I qualified for the job. Okay, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna make believe. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, how, what I think higher education should look like and inevitably will look like in, in many years, in a few years. And I think that the sooner the better. In the future, there will be three kinds of universities. One is the Harvard Stanford of the world. You know, if Harvard choose and you mention it to, to a charge a million dollar a year, they will still have more people that are willing to pay it more than they're willing to accept. So this is one, one that's the, the one uh, extreme. The other extreme will be universities like ourselves that offer quality at extremely low price. They don't give what Harvard, but they give cool quality. All the rest of the university should find what's the room, what, what's their place in between. Because if you are, you know, if you come and say my, and, and you should choose what's your specialty and what's the price point for it. So if you are, a university that specializes in ancient Greek, great, there are a lot of people who want to study ancient Greek. How much are you willing to pay for it? If you are the best university in Northeast Iowa, there are people from your locality that want to study with their peers and found job locally and they will come to you. But what's the price point for it? Because they can study with me with, you know, less than $5,000 per degree. How much are you willing to pay in order to study with your peers locally? 10,000 for a degree? Maybe, but not 100,000 for a degree. So all universities should find what's their place in the spectrum and what, and what should be uh, the relevant price point. And I think that the people who, <laughs> the next secretary of education should push hard universities, first of all, to open their gates much more widely, to take more students, because what we show that you can take unlimited number of uh, students and what's their place and what's the price point. And by the way, what should be the relations between online and offline? Because you can, you know, you can have half a degree online, half offline. You can teach one year tuition free with us and three years on campus or two years of tuition free and two years on campus, save half of the cost of uh, higher education. So there are so many models and they will develop. If, if I had any power, I would push them to do it faster because otherwise they will lose it all the way. Well, Shai, this was great. And I want to thank you again for everything you're doing. Um, I think it's having a massive societal impact. And I just to get my $6, keep scaling up. <laughs> thank you. And uh, I'm sure that the $6 is, uh, will come. It will come to you. Don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was a great conversation. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone who attended it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Shai. Take care. See you soon. Thanks.